Hello, uh, my name is Brendan Yates. I am here with Miss Lana Smith. She is a close personal friend of my family. Um, she's also an Omaha native. Um, and she's agreed to be my interviewee for my paper. Um, and my subject is dealing with uh, how civil rights affected, how the civil rights movement affected you know, we, when we think about the civil rights movement in the South, we, all, we always associate it with the South, but we never know how it affected from the, um, the other other areas. So we are living in Omaha, Nebraska, which is in right middle and right in the middle of every United States of America. I checked the map. We are literally in the middle. So we are definitely at the epitome of Midwest. <laughs> so. Um, and she has agreed to give us a just a background and have a conversation about what it was like during that time here in Omaha, Nebraska. So, uh, Miss Lana, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm born and raised here in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, retired from UPS. Uh, have three children, uh, one deceased, and. One married with his children here, and another married, and she is in New York. She lives in New York and is on Broadway. Of course, they're going to shut down right now. Right. So, um, let's see. Um, and just to piggyback on some of the things, you are a widow. Mm -hmm. uh, you were married to Mr. Rudy Smith, who you had to meet him. He, he, he would have loved him too, everyone. Um, how long were you married? We were married 52 years, and Rudy was a photojournalist for the Omaha World Herald for 45 years. And he also taught, he was a professor, or he would teach at UNO journalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, man. I didn't, I, now that part I didn't know. Uh -huh. I really didn't know. Okay, so let's start with some of the questions that I have. Okay. Um, Let's start with this. Tell me a little about your husband and his role in the civil rights movement. Uh, back in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s, Rudy was president of the NAACP youth. And um, racism was heavy here at the time. And uh, they were always picket. They did pickets downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had got to the point where a lot of the pastors would join a lot of the times wherever they would you know be picketing or um like if they were holding they do sit-ins they did a lot of sit-ins and one of the main things they really he changed a lot but one of the main things they really changed was a park called peony park mm -hmm. that was on cad street mm -hmm. but anyway they pick it there because they had a swimming pool there and they had places for a dance and a ballroom like for proms and all and blacks were not allowed out there well they picked it there for like about three or four days straight and uh, finally within a week I think it took a week or two when they finally decided to open it up uh, to blacks okay and he um, he'd always attend the conventions I wish I had some of his pictures I wasn't thinking about bringing them up but uh, he would always go to the NAACP conventions and there's where he met a lot of other youth presidents of the other NWCP youth from down south and him and the one from Alabama and Mississippi they became very good friends and when they found out that they were that Rudy and his crew up here was going to be picketing and doing sit-ins they sent a lot of the signs that Alabama sent from Montgomery some of the signs they really? used showing where the dogs were attacking them and everything. They sent about five or six of their posters, their signs, and they marched with those signs. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Wow, now that's a piece of history to have in your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's all, he got pictures of them oh, doing man. the march that's with those awesome. signs. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Um, in general, what was the general atmosphere of the civil rights movement here in Omaha? In Omaha, blacks were contained in a certain area. We didn't it was like from maybe 16th Street to 33rd mm -hmm. and over to not too many of us made it as far as Zane's. We really wasn't hardly that far at the time. So we were used to being around each other because we were just in that environment. The only time we really came uh, in contact with white people, every time we went shopping or went to the stores or where we had to work, uh, a lot of the downtown stores 
uh, didn't allow blacks. Blacks weren't allowed. And what I remember a lot, so it's not like it was really heavy until as we got older, mm -hmm. was it more noticeable how racism was so heavy here? Because almost just like in the South, the adults here, they didn't fight it. They didn't, because a lot of them came from the South. Mm -hmm. Uh, so therefore, and being, it, you know, we were minorities here, they definitely, you know, didn't buck the system. But once m most of us got older, we did. Okay. Um, but one of the main things I would always remember on Saturdays, what I would do, I'd always save change from where I've been to the store and use that for my little pocket change. And we'd go downtown to the theater. It was called the state, any of the theaters downtown, uh, Blacks had to go to the balcony. If it was one of the theaters that didn't have balconies, then you didn't, you couldn't go you in. Couldn't go in. Um, unless mm -hmm. you went on a day when it wasn't crowded, and even then you'd have to sit in the back. Mm -hmm. um, so, and even riding the bus here, it was like we were sitting almost in the back. It wasn't like you'd get right on the bus and sit up front. No, mm -hmm. you couldn't do all that. Uh, so it was like racism existed but as we got older and became teenagers is when we really did begin to, you know, buck the system. Start to, I guess, that the the uh, really trying to see, you were starting to see what's really going on. And mm -hmm. so little being having that rebellious spirit, like, right. this isn't right, right. This isn't, isn't fair. Um, and I guess that kind of goes into my next question. Mm -hmm. um, of course, one of, the, one of the biggest turning points in the South was um, or, or even the most turning points when when blacks really started to take a stand for themselves was boycotting the bus system was there ever a time that there was a boycott here in omaha that's similar but not necessarily had the biggest effect on that scale no um no not not hardly at all all of all of the marching and well but we never really had no boycotts there okay. was never really no boycotts um, and most of our older people at the time, most of them did do, uh, women did day work. And a lot of the men just worked like in a lot of the hotels as cooks or chefs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they could always get, you know, always catch the bus going or okay. maybe one, one, somebody in a household might have a car. So there really was never any particular boycott that existed here. Okay. So there was nothing as far as what was going on in the South that, that, that affected what was happening here in the Midwest as far as Omaha or, or sparked something? Uh, well, it did. That's what really kind of sparked Rudy and his group was watching what was going on in the mm -hmm. South. And um, then when he had a chance to hear, we heard Dr. Martin Luther King speak uh -huh. at a convention, I think they went to in Denver. Uh -huh. And... Um, that really uh, kind of sparked them. It really, and once he came back and was talking with his youth and they could see what was happening on TV. Well, a lot of white people up here, to them, that was like, they really couldn't believe or didn't want to believe or thought nothing of it, what was happening down there. But it affected us up here to the point where we need to make changes. Changes need to be made. So that's when a lot of the protesting had started and the sit-ins uh, that had started and changes okay, okay. were made. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, so good, good, that good. So, to to a point, it wasn't something on the grand scale of boycotting the bus right. system, but there was a point where you you all decided to take a stand right. on something that right. was not right. Okay, especially after seeing what was happening. Especially after in seeing India. what was seeing in the mm -hmm. south. Okay, okay. Did you or Rudy have a chance to participate in any marches that were held in the south? Or, or maybe the march, or or in the march on Washington. Uh, he did. Rudy went to the march on Washington. Okay. Um, so he got to hear the speech. Yes. Oh, yes. I just got goosebumps. Wow. Yes, <laughs> so, he did. Um, and when he brought that back, I mean, it and to hear the because to us, Martin Luther King, I mean. My gosh, he was right. really somebody. Right. So to actually, for him to actually been there, that would have been his second time actually seeing him and hearing him. But that speech, oh, it changed a lot. Um, matter of fact, um, 
really pictures, one of the main reasons, most of his pictures that he loved to take was in, in the hood, anywhere down 24th Street or whatever down there because Martin Luther King was, he'd always mention the fact about how we do have a life. Black people, we have lives. And he would stress the fact of what we are capable of doing, what we can do as a people. And that struck a note with Rudy as far as showing light in the black in the hood. Because uh, all they would see from our community was mugshots. Mm -hmm. Usually you go see a mugshot or, you know, a shooting or a death or whatever. But to really see how we live, uh, you know, folks were scared to come to the north side, always hearing about what went on and black mm -hmm. ain't this and black. But because of a lot of the pictures he would take, mm -hmm. uh, some were just really, I mean, they really didn't realize how our life was no different than y'all. Y'all just got more money, maybe, but, <laughs> you know. So a lot of encouragement came from seeing and hearing what was going on in the South. Rudy did do one march in Mississippi. They had a convention down there, and he got there early enough to do a march with them mm -hmm. um, in Mississippi. I don't know if it was Jackson or, or where, but he did do a march in Mississippi, and he came back talking about the difference of marching down there when you had the Klan, you know, <laughs> standing all along the way and right. throwing stuff right. at throwing them or punching them. And I mean, and they had trained for all of that here in case it were ever to happen. Wait, they had there trained. was formal training on how to handle being attacked by. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, That's yeah. like, so you basically, basically were trained for war. We had to be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wow. mean, it, yeah. And so when he got down there, it was different because the attacks actually happened, but he was prepared. But it just, I think, shocked him to see it on that scale. Right, right. You There's know? one thing to see it on TV until you actually yeah, are standing in it. You, it's a whole nother feeling. Totally different world. Totally, totally different, different, world. different world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I totally understand that. Totally get that, mm -hmm. man. Woo! I just mm -hmm. wow. Okay, okay, okay. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. All right. No, I actually have two more questions. Okay. Do you remember where you were, or at least if you want to share how old you were the day when you found out Martin Luther King was assassinated? I was in '68, wasn't it? Um, Rudy and I were out, or he had just got off work, because it was in the evening, afternoon. Yeah, but I just read about that. I'm sorry. It was like he was work he was working at the World Herald then. He started working in sixty three and he had just got off and we were going somewhere and we had a little raggedy radio on in the car and we heard that and it's like we pulled over everything. I mean Nothing. we couldn't even talk. And cars were going by honking and shouting, He's dead, he's dead. Uh it was just a shockwave in the black community because we were you know right there in the hood when you know word came it was just a shock it took us a while before we could even talk mm -hmm. let me ask this question if, as far as the black community again did that did you all have the same reaction when john f kennedy was yes yeah, same same reaction um and almost well i ain't gonna say even more so but the same, if not more so, mainly because we looked at it as, well, Martin Luther King, he was, well, of course, he definitely was our hero, and we definitely grieved and mourned him because mm -hmm. we had never had a leader like him. Mm -hmm. Everybody wasn't into uh, the Muslims, into Muhammad, mm -hmm. um, and um, what's Malcolm X. Yeah, Malcolm X, even though Malcolm X was born and raised here. Yes, he was. Malcolm X was born and raised here. We have a street yes. named after him. Is yes. This, isn't, got, isn't this house still there? His house is still there. His yes. historical yes, landmark. Yes, it's historical, right. Uh, but when, so when JFK was shot, it was a matter of, here is the man who made it to become president, which was really where it's like he could really mm -hmm. do so much good for us, for our people. But what was shocking, oh, oh, I wish they had that picture here. But uh, Robert Kennedy came to Omaha. Okay. And one of the main reasons he had came because he had been hearing about the riots that were going on here. Well, it's like, how did you hear about riots here in Omaha? And 
of course, Rudy interviewed him and Rudy took his picture on 24th Street when he was addressing a crowd. Uh -huh. uh, and that picture hit all across the country because it was like just two weeks later after that, he was assassinated. Uh, but your so, main so, so there was riot. There was a riot. To, to oh, the, there was yes, riots. When, there was rioting. Okay, okay. That wasn't one of your questions. No, but, but that's that. That will move on. Move on. Okay. Move on. So, so there was. So there was. So there was a reaction other than just shock. The anger. Well, the, what had happened? A young girl named Vivian Strong. Uh, she lived in the projects down off of Twenty Fourth Street, off of Park, uh -huh. and there was a curfew at the time. And um, so everybody was running, heading home, because you had to be in by eight, I think it was. Okay. And uh, she was one of the last of the kids down there in the projects, heading home, because she had forgot something and it went back to get it and was heading home. And they hollered at her, telling her, you supposed to be in, what are you doing out or whatever? She turned around and said, I'm going home, I'm going home. And as she was running, this police officer shot and killed her. Shot her in the back of the head, 12 years old. And that sparked a riot because things were tense uh, already. Oh, because they were so tense. This, so this, this happened after the assassination. So everything was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, oh, yeah. So it was very tense. The, the atmosphere there you go. <laughs> was very, <laughs> very tense. Okay, okay. And that shooting sparked rioting from 24th in like from like 24th and Clark Street all the way down to Lake. Buildings were set on fire. Uh, multiple cocktails were thrown mm -hmm. into the buildings and um, Rudy was the only photographer that would cover it and no whites would go into I, the area. As a white photographer, I wouldn't go in. <laughs> no. Either. Like, uh, I need you to go down there. You go over there by yourself. Okay. <laughs> Going down there. Yeah, no, none of them went. So the only pictures of the riot actually getting started where buildings were still burning was him. But then he almost lost his life. As he was going, as he parked his car, like on 20th Street, mm -hmm. to walk down. Well, National Guards were called out. It was just that bad. We had National Guards out, and when Rudy made it almost to 24th, uh, one of the National Guards stopped him, and four others came over when they heard him hollering, uh, stop, stop, or we'll shoot you, and Rudy showed him his ID. Showed that he was, on, he was working. He was working, and he was officially on the job. Yeah. And the guy said, I'm just going to take you around the building and shoot you because you ain't nothing but a nigga. You ain't supposed to even be down here. I don't care who you are. Huh. And they had turned him around. There was four of them that was with him. And they had turned him around and was marching him behind the building. And the mayor, him and some of his cohorts, happened to be down there huh. to see what was really, how it was really, uh, what was really going on. Mm -hmm. And Rudy hollered for him. He called him mayor because the mayor knew him. Uh -huh. And Rudy called for him and said, Mayor, Mayor, they're trying to kill me. And the mayor turned around because he heard him. And he said, bring him over here. And they, they brought him over there. And the mayor asked, well, what was he doing? And this didn't he show his idea or whatever? But anyway, the two main ones, they were discharged. They they was totally discharged from leaving here. The mayor actually talked to their commander in, in, and, told, and sent them and away. And let him know, yeah, what they was about to do. He told him he wanted him out of here. So those two particular ones was out of here. and. Yeah. Uh, I don't, we don't know whatever happened to him, but Rudy's life was really on the line at that time. Wow. But he, the pictures he took, uh, they made front page practically all across the country. It was like, who could believe a riot was in going Omaha. on in Omaha, Nebraska? I'm sure it was thinking back then, there are black people in Omaha? Yes, yes. <laughs> and they're rioting. And they're rioting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I, well I, you know, honestly, I think that went towards my last question, but I mean, if you want to add to it, so... Uh, we talked about this a little bit during the time that you were buying a house, and I guess it oh, goes mm -hmm. to my question: okay. Have you personally ever experienced racism during this time? Yeah. And, you, and then you told me a story about your house. So share that with me again, please. Uh, we were looking to buy a home, and Raven Oaks, which was a real nice, real nice area, it was brand new back then. It was new, and uh, we had looked. Like, right, we made it over to Ames. We was on 49th and Ruggles, just a few blocks mm -hmm. from Ames. And then we thought, well, uh, once we found out and had our accountant let us know how much we could afford, 
for a house. We thought, oh, well, then we go look at Raven Oak. We were using NP Dodge at the time, mm -hmm. which we found out, of course, later, they was one of the racist realtors here in Omaha. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, so when we went to look at the house in Raven Oak, it was beautiful, just absolutely perfect. The house we were going to buy on Ruggles, it was for $21,950. And the one in Raven Oaks was twenty two nine fifty. So just to emphasize that, that that they could afford what was your what was your twenty five twenty five thousand. So twenty five thousand would have bought you a what? What's that? Oh, what kind of house? Uh, we could have had a three or four bedroom house, a uh, two car garage, uh, big time. We could have went big time. So that level was, or even ranch. So I should tell you the economy. <laughs> right, and this right. was when? 70? Yeah, 67, 67, 67, about 70, 71. 70, $25,000 uh -huh. could buy you a two car, three bedroom, what? Probably two bath house. Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. You can't, buy, you can't buy a car for $25,000. No, you can't. <laughs> and you know, when I think about it, when you asked me about that, I thought about it. That was really cheap. That was. Man, and it was probably immaculate. The twenty five thousand was an immaculate home. It was. Home. It was a split level, <laughs> huge finished basement, everything, huge fenced in backyard. Oh my you know. Gosh. <laughs> and it was only twenty two nine fifty. And okay. our realtor said, "Oh no, we couldn't afford that. Um, that's a little bit too high." Because we had seen it, and we called her to let her know what we were looking at, and to see if she'd come out. So we could look, you know, check it out on the inside. And uh, she had already checked it out before she got to us because we were out there waiting because uh -huh. we were going to go looking that day, but we hadn't, we didn't have Raven Oaks down. But anyway, she met us there. And as soon as we got out the car, first thing she said is, well, you really can't afford this. This one is going at twenty two nine fifty, and that's a little bit over your budget. We went to explain, well, no. Our accountant and our money says we can do 25. She said, but then she went to adding all this and that, and then your mortgage payment would really be overly ex expensive. You really would be in a bind. Okay. So how did you, how did you, did you get the home? We didn't get that one, but we did go on and get our Ruggles Street home. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We did. So, was, so was the reason for not going for that home was because you just didn't want to go through the hassle of trying to fight to convince this uh, person? She absolutely was just saying there was no way we could afford it, even if we applied for it. I mean, she had fixed it. So now Rudy was the one that was ready to argue her down about, you know, about that. And he did to a point, And then it was like, we, we figured, well, okay, Lord, then we just, we'll go with what we got. Okay. Cause it really would have been a hassle after talking to her. And when we really realized the reason and we found out MP Dodge did have a line that blacks couldn't cross. They were to make sure we wow. did not sit and Raven Oaks happened to be one of them. Wow. And again, just to touch on touch base on this, we where we live right now is uh, well the area that we're in now is probably northwest Omaha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So by northwest Omaha. And I I live another fifteen minutes north. Not even fifteen, maybe ten minutes north. I'm I'm on thirtieth street. And so the area that we're living in was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, this was predominantly a white area. Mm -hmm. This is part This is part of the line that MP Dodge wouldn't let you cross. Uh-huh, right. Oh, no, not okay. where you were. No. Not, well, no, I'm talking about where, you, where we are right now. Your oh, house. oh, no, no. Over here? And like I said, if we made it to Ames, we wouldn't pass. Oh, that's right. We couldn't go. Ames, Ames, was, Ames was the boundary line. That basically. was the boundary line. And then you only go... Um, we right. 40th maybe right so well, we're at high school is over there right right and we were and and we're, where we are now at her home we're probably about 10 minutes away from Ains, maybe 10 minutes less away from Ains. so the boundary line so that should give you an idea where we are right now mm -hmm. we're 10 minutes from what used to be the boundary line right so we're pretty we're pretty deep into the boundary, boundary right line. out of bounds we're, out we're of totally bounds. out of we're bounds so out, we're so out of bounds we lost the game yeah so. bur <laughs> yeah bur well, um, wow. So, so in a way, I guess the history of the civil rights era, it, it was prevalent here in Omaha, but not as so much in the deep South. You know, there was, I mean, the, the rioting was probably the, probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. happened in Omaha during that time. Yeah. But as far as the, but as far as the, the, um, 
the uh, what's we looking for the uh, interaction between blacks and whites it wasn't as bad as the South. No, I mean okay. it existed. It existed, but it, it it existed, and you know, sitting in the balcony in the movie right. theater, riding the back of the bus, which honestly, I liked riding the back. Of the bus. <laughs> when I was in high school. Yeah. I, Right. Sitting in the balcony in the movie theater, I'm not being bothered. I'm uh-huh. okay with that. But back then, it was a it was a principle. It was right. a principle of the matter. Principle the right, it's a principle of the thing. So, I guess it's safe to say that although, I guess it is easy to say that although racism was 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 here, it just was not as mm-hmm. out there, or is it, it's not as big of a history as it was from being in the South, as far as that. And white people are were different here. It was like in the South. They let you know they didn't like you. You'd be called a nigga in a minute. You knew not to look them in the face. You knew you had to walk around, or if they was coming past, you'd have to move, all of that. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, they were more so, they kept it quiet. Like, they probably didn't like, couldn't stand them. But they weren't verbal like what they were in the South. These were just sneaky white folks up here. Sort of um, like it is now. They, they, yeah, they, yeah. Sort of like it is. Sort of like it is now. Sort of, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you had to pay attention to notice, unless someone's just that crazy and that's right. don't care. But they're pretty. It's, it's the same. About here. the same. It's about the same. Here, yeah. But in in the south, uh, they let you know. They let you know. Yeah, they, they let. Yeah, they do. So yeah, there's a difference there's between a diff- them and here. So yeah. So even. So yeah. So I mean, we could easily uh-huh. say even the the white culture, so to speak, was more as far as against blacks. In the South, you knew, uh-huh, you, right? You knew you your knew. place. Yeah, here, yeah. Here, like we, you have a place, but I'm not gonna say anything. Say anything, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just supposed <laughs> to do it or right. keep your distance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Miss Miss Lana, thank you so much for this. I well, really thank appreciate you for it. Asking me, um, did you have any final words you'd like to share, or? Um, there was one thing when we talk of education. Okay. Okay. Um. And going to, all, of course, all the high schools, we were always the minority. I graduated from North High School back in 1966. <laughs> and it was out of a class of 300. Mm-hmm. And it might have been maybe 50 of us. I might be pushing it. Maybe 40 of us. But most of the counselors would always tell us that there was no need in even thinking of going to college. Or you're not college material. You might want to look at taking a trade or whatever. Mm-hmm. And come to find out, most of the counselors, that's what they told all of us. You might have had only one good counselor that would encourage us to, you know, go further above and beyond. But other than that, that even existed, of course, in the school. So mm-hmm. no matter how intelligent you were, didn't how good, matter. good grades you were, they they were almost they were almost trained I want to. I want. Well, no, we can say trained, mm-hmm. trained to encourage you to think low. Oh yeah. Oh, maybe maybe the military. You know. Yeah, some, the, mil- the military. The men, yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah, my father-in-law like told me that he was told the same thing. And, and, and you have to ask yourself why did they do that? Yes. Was it? You know. Was it for their protection, or was it because no matter how hard they would have worked at that time, they probably figured no matter how hard you work, you're not going to get far. And they were looking out more so for their kids. It was a matter of a scholarship that we might would have got. Oh well, no, they go give it to Tom, Dick, and Mary, uh-huh. you know, but not uh, Shiana or Tina or Connie. No, it was for them. So yeah, they were looking out for their kids. Oh, so the counselors were white. So these oh yeah. White. Oh yeah. Oh okay. 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 Well, then that makes sense. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. They were all white. All mm. the counselors were. So yeah, they were looking out for their kids. Uh, they would be the ones to get those scholarships that we could have gotten, you know. But anyway, that was the life back then in the sixties here. No, but you have, but you're you're living proof that you can overcome these things. And, oh yeah. And you have a wonderful life. You had great history. I mean, the life you experienced with your husband is something that, wow. Yep, 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 right there. Yeah, and, and look at and look at your children now. You, you got yeah, you have one yeah. child. One child's on Broadway. Yeah, doing yeah. her thing. And what is your your son, other son? Rudy Junior. Rudy, he's just a hard worker with his mm-hmm. family. Yeah, he and he works at UPS. He ended up working at UPS. He works at night at UPS, and then he has another job as well. Yes, he followed in his mother's footsteps and went to UPS. Thank you so much for this moment, yeah. uh, this moment in history, and I appreciate it. I'm really going to be sharing this with my kids, and 
and I'm going to go home and doctor this up and share it with my class. Thank okay. you very much. Well, thank you for asking me, Brendan. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I'm going to let you have your dinner now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs>